all right so we began a new chapter last time okay and the chapter was on random variables so we looked at discrete and continuous random variables and we defined a lot of concepts such as the probability density function the cumulative distribution function all right and uh, then we looked at the expectation and its properties we looked at variance and covariance and we stopped at somewhere around markov and chebyshev's inequality all right so we will uh, continue with that and then we will go back to looking at the median all right uh, because we have to do a particular proof related to the median which we did not do last time and after that i will move ahead with a weak law of large numbers joint and conditional cdfs pdfs and so on all right so let's move on to uh, markov's inequality all right so markov's inequality states that let x be a random variable that is non negative and then for any a greater than 0 we have the probability that x is greater than or equal to a being less than expectation of x divided by a and i think we did the proof last time correct we did this proof okay so i'm not going to repeat it then uh, using markov's inequality we derived chebyshev's inequality all right and uh, this version of chebyshev's inequality is a lot more uh, elegant and compact than the other versions we've seen in the earlier chapters okay so the proof first of all the proof of chebyshev's inequality follows almost immediately from markov's inequality right so the only sort of thing only real step is we are going to regard x minus mu squared as a non negative random variable all right because x is a random variable and this is a function of x and clearly it is non negative so it satisfies the sufficient condition for markov's inequality and then uh, we have probability that x minus mu square greater than equal to k square is less than or equal to expectation of x minus mu squared divided by k squared all right and this is nothing but sigma square by k square so consequently uh, i have a uh, probability of x minus mu square greater than or equal to k square is less than or equal to sigma square by k square and uh, i can just replace this event by the equivalent event that x minus mu absolute value is greater than or equal to k and of course the bound on the probability remains unchanged so this is the proof of chebyshev's inequality now we can uh, consider another form okay which is more intuitive so instead of this k uh, you know uh, we can replace it by k sigma because that tells you how many standard deviations away from the mean right that was missing in the earlier form so there's uh, there's nothing really uh, very very different you're going to replace k by k sigma and then this bound on the right hand side is going to reduce to 1 by k square and this was the form that we had earlier seen okay so uh, let's get back to counting money okay which was the motivating example for studying these inequalities okay so let us say that the average annual salary offered to a cse btech 4 at iitb is a, is 100000 us dollars okay let us say all right i'm just saying let us assume all right so what's the probability that a randomly chosen student will get an offer of 110k or more that's question 1 and then if i told you that the variance of the salary was 50000 us dollars then what's the probability that your package is going to be between 90k uh, and 110k all right this is annual salary by the way okay so um, all right so let's so, uh, sort of solve this problem um, so clearly you know the first part that x is greater than or equal to 110k uh what is this this comes from markov's inequality so the probability of this event occurring okay is less than or equal to 100k which is the expected value divided by 110k right so that is 90% all right so the probability of this happening is less than 90% all right any questions or comments 
then the other event is that uh, your salary uh, was uh, between uh, some 90k to 110k. So, what I am saying is what is the probability that it is outside this range all right greater than 110 and less than 90 and this comes from Chebyshev right. So, this is less than or equal to what 50k which is the variance divided by k squared which is 10k times 10k. So, this is uh, less than or equal to 0 0.05 0, uh, uh, 0 percent. All right, so the probability that your package fell in this 90k to 110k range is basically 99.5 percent. All right, so that's a pretty decent probability. Okay. All right, of course, all of this is if the average was 100k. Yes, question. Variance is 50k. Pardon me. Uh, why is it not matching? Sigma squared is rupee square or dollar squared and you have k which is also in terms of dollars ok. By k I mean the little k uh, not this capital K for 1000 ok. So, indeed the units cancel out and it is a ratio ok. Does it answer your question or I have answered some other question? Huh? No, it does not answer the question. So, of course, the units match all right. You do not want probability in terms of dollars, you know this is currency independent ok. Ok, now we are going to look at the expected value uh, a little bit more closely and we are going to study a law which is called as the weak law of large numbers. See if so many people talk in class then I cannot hear myself all right that is not a good thing ok. So, when I tell you that the expected value of a random die variable ok, when I throw a die the random uh, the expected value is 3.5 what does that mean all right. It means the following if I throw the dice uh, some n times and I average the results I should get a value close to 3.5 provided that n is large ok. This is not valid for very small values of n. In fact, nothing in statistics is really valid for very, very tiny values of the number of samples ok. This is all in the realm where you have really a large number of samples. It is only then that things like standard deviation, variance or expectation and all of this makes any sense. So, as n increases one would typically expect that the average should move closer and closer towards 3.5. All right, and that's our intuition. All right, that's common sense. That's what people usually think. And what the people think in this way is actually true. All right, and there is a theorem which is called as the law of large numbers. All right, so here is an illustration of the law of large numbers. This is taken from Wikipedia, where this is an actual experiment where I'm throwing a dice, an unbiased dice multiple times and I am finding the average. So, the red curve is the actual observed averages and as you see uh, as the number of trials increases you know anything beyond 400 and above it is starting to graze the 3.5 line which is in green color all right. So, this is like an experimental uh, confirmation of our intuition right, but there is a proper full fledged theorem about this which is called as the weak law of large numbers. So, our intuition which I spelt out on these earlier slides has actually a, a rigorous theoretical justification. All right, so what is this theorem? So, let us say x1, x2 all the way through to xn. Uh, these are a sequence of independent and identically distributed random variables, each having mean mu. I will uh, spell out the definition of independent random variables properly later on ok. Right now just take my word for it. I will also spell out later on uh, a few lectures down the line what I mean by identically distributed, but for now just leave it ok. So, each of these random variables has uh, expectation mu, then we can say the following 
you pick any epsilon greater than 0, then the probability that this average, so what is this? x1 plus x2 plus xn divided by n, right? This is the arithmetic mean of all those guys. The probability that this average deviates from the mean, now this is the true mean, okay? This is the true mean of the random variable, not the result of experiments, okay? So, that is mu. So, the, uh, the probability that this computed mean deviates from the true mean by a value of more than epsilon, all right? This is the event that we are concerned. The probability of that event is going to tend to 0 as n tends to infinity, all right? So, in other words, given any epsilon, all right, it is going to be increasingly unlikely that my uh, computed average is going to deviate significantly from the what is considered to be the true average. So, what do I mean by true average? You know that if I throw a dice and it is totally unbiased, you should get uh, an average uh, value of 3.5, right? So, that is very simple arithmetic. But what I am saying is as I indeed throw the dice more and more often, I am going to approach this value of 3.5. So, the mu is 3.5 and these are my calculations here, all right? So, this is called famously as the weak law of large numbers, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, the, the way this is defined is, uh, I throw a dice once and the output that I get is x1, that is the random variable x1, okay. If I do it the second time, the output that I get, I am calling it random variable x2 and xn, alright. No, mu is uh, what is really the, yeah, it is the mean of each of them, alright. So, each of them, so these are called as identically distributed random variables, okay. So, forget about identically distributed, but each of these random variables has a mean of mu. Because on an average, okay, for any one of them, the expected value is 3.5, okay. Here I am regarding them as different random variables for the sake of illustration, okay. So, this is again, this is the true mean, this is the result of the experiment, alright. So, these two things are different. So, the true mean does not change when I increase the number of trials. The estimated mean does change when I increase the number of trials. Alright. So, now we are going to prove this theorem, okay. So, this experimental mean, it is also called as the empirical mean. Empirical means the result of experiments and it is also called the sample mean. These things uh, refer to the same thing, these different terminologies. Okay, so the proof follows immediately from Chebyshev's inequality, all right. So, here is how. So, uh, the expectation of x1 plus x2 plus dot 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 xn divided by n is mu, okay. Are you guys convinced by this statement? Okay, any doubts about this? Remember, x1 plus x2 plus dot 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 xn divided by n, this is a random variable, okay. It is not a constant, it is a random variable. So, it makes sense to uh, assign it various statistical properties, all right. So, how will I, how will I prove this in one step from first principles? How will I prove this? I will do e x1 plus e x2 plus dot 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 uh, e x n divided by n. Now, each of them had mean mu. So, the numerator is n mu and it is divided by n. So, you get a mu, okay. Is this clear? The variance is variance of x 1 plus x 2 plus dot 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 x n divided by n. This is what? Maybe I should write this out. See, this n is a constant, all right. 
So, I can write this as 1 by n squared variance of x1 plus x2. Right, we have seen this last class. If there is a constant, variance of ax is a square times variance of x. So, this 1 by n squared and the variance of each of these guys is sigma squared and there is n of these guys. So, you get sigma square by n. Is this fair enough? Any doubts? Ah, this is a great question, ok. These are independent random variables, that is why, alright. So, uh, we will properly prove this just a few slides down the line, ok, when we define independence, alright. So, this, this statement that I made over here is true, ok, only because x1, x2, xn are independent. If they were not, this would not be true, ok, but this is a very good question. Okay, and I will fill you in with these details uh, a little bit later. So, we get the variance to be sigma square by n and therefore, now what is left? Just you have to plug into uh, the formula for Chebyshev and uh, we have the random variable x1 plus x2 plus dot 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 xn divided by n minus mu, okay. Uh, this probability being greater than epsilon is less than or equal to sigma squared by n epsilon squared. Alright, so what is the epsilon? You tell me whichever epsilon you want. It may be arbitrarily small in value, but this still holds. So, you got sigma squared by n epsilon squared, right. So, now when you take the limit of this probability when n tends to infinity, this probability uh, is less than or equal to 0, right. So, then that basically proves the weak law of large numbers, alright. Very straightforward application of Chebyshev's inequality, right. Fair enough questions or comments? I will uh, identi identically distributed random variables are random variables that have the same distribution, ok, the same distribution. In this case, what is the distribution? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all of these taking, uh, uh, all of these being equiprobable, that is the, the probability that each of these numbers shows up on the dice is 1 by 6, alright. So, all these random variables x1, x2 all the way through to xn have the same probability mass function in this particular case, ok, because they are discrete, right. So, that is the meaning of identically distributed. So, this limit n tends to infinity goes to uh, is equal to 0, all right. So, now the, this was the weak law of large numbers, there also exists something which is called the strong law of large numbers, all right, which is really not part of our syllabus, but I am just mentioning it in the passing. The strong law basically states in the limit when n tends to infinity, this average, ok. So, the limit n tends to infinity, this average being equal to mu, ok, this is equal to 1, ok. So, probability of this event does not tend towards 1, but it is equal to 1, alright. So, it is stronger than the weak law. However, for practical experiments, it does not make much of a difference, ok. If you study advanced probability theory, uh, it, it, it is of use or relevance over there. General experimental results, this does not make much of a difference, alright. So, this is stronger than the weak law because the strong law states that the probability of the desired event, that is that the empirical mean be equal to the actual mean, is equal to 1 given enough samples the weak law states that it tends to 1, alright. So, the strong law is slightly stronger, so to speak. The proof of the strong law is very, very formidable, ok, and it is completely beyond the scope of this course. If you take a very, very advanced probability theory course in, in a typical mathematics department, ok, that is where you would study proofs of that nature, ok. Alright, so now let us move on. Uh, 
to a slightly lighter subtopic okay before we get into more advanced stuff okay so you know uh, there is this thing called as the law of averages which we speak of in day to day life all right so you know as laymen if we you know we tend to believe that if something has been going wrong for a very long time then somehow you know uh, it will suddenly turn right okay and we say that is the law of averages all right so for example you know i knew somebody who uh, flunked uh, his driving test some four times okay for very strange reasons every time okay and then you know we used to all joke around and say that you know if flunked this four times and next time fifth time you're going to be lucky okay? and it's going to change by the law of averages all right so india losing against australia in cricket okay four times in a row then we say by law of averages we will win the fifth time okay so the law of averages okay uh, this is okay in you know for everyday conversations but statistically speaking it is not true all right it is a fallacy in fact it is called as the gambler's fallacy as i explain next slide okay so it actually reflects wishful thinking on our part you know we really want things to turn out for the better and then therefore we made it into a law of averages okay so the core mistake that is being made here is that the distribution of samples among a small set of outcomes okay so we are trying to estimate the distribution of samples from uh, uh, you know from a very small sample set and say then you know it's uh, it, it's going to be working out for everything all right so for example you know let's say a gambler independently tosses an unbiased coin 20 times and gets a head each time and then you know you can apply the law of averages and say you know the next time i'm really going to get a tail because of law of averages all right so this is a fallacy this will not hold true okay and the mistake is as follows the probability of getting all 21 heads is 1 by 2 raised to 21 the probability of getting 20 heads and one tail is also 1 by 2 raised to 21 all right so the law of averages all right uh, as we tend to think of it is not true okay? each of these configurations is equally probable you could think of having the number of heads and the number of tails that's a different matter okay but as such these events are equal probable okay uh and remember what is the real thing that is going on here 20 is a very small number statistically speaking okay now if you got a heads Uh, on an unbiased coin some you know 20000 times or 2 million times you know then you have to start uh, suspecting whether it was truly uh, unbiased okay or whether it was a coin with both heads okay so that kind of thing all right okay now before i move on to joint pdfs pmfs and stuff like that uh, let us go back a couple of slides and do that proof on the median so what proof am i talking about so last class we proved that the quantity which minimizes expectation of x minus c squared is e of x which is mu in this case so we proved that it was a two three step proof now we are going to change this x minus c squared to uh, x minus c uh, absolute value all right so in other words i want to find a value c such that the expectation of x minus c absolute value is minimized okay so this is the proof for that so uh, which is the quantity i want to minimize jc equal to integral minus infinity to infinity x minus c absolute value fx x dx so why am i saying i want to minimize this what is this quantity indicating expectation of x minus c absolute value that's what i want to okay so i've just written it out in uh, more elaborately so now i'm going to do the following i'm going to split this integral into two integrals negative infinity to c x minus c fx x dx and c to infinity all right any questions about this step now i don't like this absolute value 
all right so i am going to remove it i have to be careful when i am doing so so in the first term see the integral is over all values x which are necessarily what less than c less than or equal to c right so i am going to change this to c minus x fx x dx and the other term contains values that are greater than c so i am going to write this as x minus c i am going to change the absolute value to x minus c so i have these two integrals okay right any issues in this step okay then i am going to open out the brackets and i get minus infinity to c c fx x dx minus x fx x dx from negative infinity to c right so the first term i have split into two terms and likewise thus this second term over here i'm going to split into another two terms which two terms this one and this one so c to infinity x fx x dx and c fx x dx okay now what can you do to this term in terms of what all we've studied okay so in this first term c of course is a constant independent of x and what about the other guy it's an integral from negative infinity to c of the probability density function right fx x is the probability density function so when you do this integral what do you get yeah you get the cdf okay so this guy becomes the cdf and the cdf at c to be very precise right and why did i do so it's the very definition of the cdf now look at this this guy the last term this c comes out as is and now it is an integral from c to infinity of the probability density function right and what is that that is 1 minus fx c okay so the it is 1 minus fx c so these two terms are dealt with right is that clear the second term and the third term they i am writing them as is we are going to deal with them separately on the next slide right is this clear okay let's move on okay so i'm uh, over here uh, i am just re rewriting whatever i had on the previous slide for reference and now i have got this guy here x fx x i am going to define it to be qx okay just for convenience and then i'm going to rewrite the function using little qx all right is this clear what i've done here now we are going to just rewrite uh this in a different form which i marked by an arrow so jc is c fx c that's that's as is so the last term is also clear and the second term is a definite integral okay so uh i'm going to replace it by capital q c minus capital q minus infinity so what is capital q it's the integral of little q all right and i have replaced this by you know it's a definite integral so q c minus q minus infinity and likewise this is q infinity minus q c okay so this q little q big q have been introduced for convenience to avoid clutter of notation all right so now what i'm going to have is i have c fx c and one more c fx c from here which add up to 2 c fx c this last c term comes out over here and i now have minus 2 q c plus q infinity plus q minus infinity 
Okay. Now, what do you think I would do next? Right. Ultimately, what do I want to do? I want to find the value c which minimizes what? j of c. Okay. So, I will take a derivative and set it to 0. Now, before I move on to the next slide, you know there is a small assumption in this uh, derivation. Okay, We are assuming that these definite integrals exist in the first place. All right, So, it is applicable only in those cases. All right, So, there are pathological PDFs for which you know these kind of definite integrals do not exist and then this particular proof would not go through. Okay, All right, so now let us move on. So, I am going to repeat that expression again and we are going to take a derivative. When you take a derivative, you are going to set it to 0. So, the first order derivative. So, this term, the first term when you take a derivative, I get 2 c little f x c because that is the derivative of the CDF plus 2 f x c. What about this c? This becomes 1. And this 2 q c capital Q c becomes 2 little q c, right. These guys are constants, so they drop off, okay. And so they do not trouble us any longer, right. So now what is next? Uh, so this step I got, all right. Now I am going to bring back, I am going to remove that q and replace it by this. Okay, and this term cancels out with this term, and I get this. So, what quantity C minimizes JC? It is that value of C for which fx C is half, and that is what? That is the median. Okay. All right, so this is the median by definition and it minimizes j c. Okay. Now, of course, there is one tiny little step left. Uh, you should do the second derivative test okay. and indeed you will see that j double prime c is greater than or equal to 0. Okay. I am not going to do it here, here in class. You can try it out. Okay. So, this is the definition of median for continuous random variables. Okay, so, it is slightly different, you know, superficially speaking, it is different from what you have for a discrete, but conceptually it is not very, very different. Now, there comes the question as to whether this c is unique, all right. So, this is an equation which the, really speaking does not have a closed form as such. So, will this be unique? Will it always be unique? No, okay. There are cases where, let us say, a particular, uh, uh, you know, probability. Uh, uh, I mean, an interval measure was zero. Okay, uh, so in that case, uh, you will basically get non-unique uh, medians. So it will be an entire range of values, any one of which could satisfy to be median. So, an equivalent way of looking at it is if you plot the curve of the CDF, there'll be some place where it is running parallel to the x axis. So, it is not strictly increasing in that regime. And so, when you cut it at 50 percent, which is half, uh, you will not cut the curve in a single point, but you will cut it in a line segment. And any point on that line segment is basically a median. Okay? Right? So, this is the, def uh, the derivation for the uh, uh, for the median being the minimizer of the average uh, absolute error. This thing is called as the absolute error x minus c absolute value f x x dx integral that is the absolute error. In fact, I should say expected absolute error. Yeah, so, any questions about this? Yes, a particular string, yeah, small uh, of a small length.
yes but uh, you know that's why i said you know the gambler getting 20000 heads on on a coin okay is extremely unlikely right okay uh, now we are going to look at joint uh, you know we are going to look at uh, tuples of random variables all right so far we were looking at individual random variables now we are going to consider groups or tuples of random variables all right because in statistics you often see that one random variable has a relationship with another all right so we've seen this uh, somewhat in class when we did the correlation coefficient all right cpi versus uh, you know uh, uh, salary offerings at the time of placements uh, these these are highly correlated uh, random variables okay um, i i don't like calling cpi a random variable but whatever okay then uh, uh, you know amount of sugar consumed and you know the readings you get in a blood sugar test so on okay so uh, we are going to define uh, joint versions of all these quantities okay so the joint cdf so given continuous random variables x and y their joint cdf is defined as capital f xy subscript okay little x little y so little x little y are the values x and y capital are the random variables so this is the probability that x less than or equal to x and y less than or equal to y so what kind of an event is this this is an intersection of two events all right so this is called as the joint probability and this is the joint cdf right any questions about this this comma basically means x less than or equal to x and y less than or equal to y and it is an intersection of events okay okay the distribution of either random variable so here we were considering x and y together right so the distribution of x just x or the distribution of just y can actually be obtained from the joint distribution all right so for example the cdf of just x at a value little x is equal to the probability that x is less than or equal to x and y is less than or equal to infinity okay and this is equal to f x y x comma infinity i will prove this or give you an idea as to why this is true just a few slides down the line okay if i forget please remind me and likewise f y also so x will be less than or equal to infinity and you know this is f x y infinity comma y and all these definitions you know whatever i have spelt out on the slide uh, extend to more than two random variables also so you can have uh, a whole bunch like some 10 random variables some 1000 random variables all together and you have the joint cdf okay so the the event that we are concerned with would be an intersection of about a thousand different events okay so we saw joint cdf like that we have joint pmf also all right this is for discrete random variables of course okay so the pmf of either random variable this is called as the marginal pmf and in fact uh, i probably missed it here these are called marginal cdfs okay marginal means for only one quantity one random variable so marginal uh, pmfs marginal cdfs how are they obtained p x equal to little x i is basically the union of x equal to x i and y equal to y j where this union is taken over this this is index j okay for every different value y j that capital y can take all right so i am writing this event as a union of a whole bunch of events right and that is fair enough correct i can clearly do that all right and now this union uh this is the probability of a union and i am actually writing it as a summation of the probabilities that x equal to xi y equal to yj and i'm summing up over j why can i do this 
why can I do this? Yes, uh, events are mutually exclusive, yes, right. So, the event that x equal to xi and y equal to y1 is mutually exclusive with respect to the event that x equal to xi and y equal to y2, right. Because if y was equal to y1, then it has no business being equal to y2, alright, quite obviously. So, so that is the reason why these events are mutually exclusive. And remember, these are joint events that are mutually exclusive. I am not saying x equal to xi is mutually exclusive with respect to y equal to y1, no. The joint events are mutually exclusive, okay. So, then consequently, this is a uh, sum of the PMFs, okay. All right, and this process, you know, of converting a joint into a marginal using summations of this nature, it is called as marginalization. All right, you can note down this word. It's called marginalization. So, as if you are taking out all possible values for this other random variable which you want to remove. All right, so there's x comma y out of which you wanted to remove y, so to speak. You could also remove x also. Okay, so here is an example of joint PMFs uh, and it has a lot of conditional probabilities. Uh, I think I will just skip this example. Uh, it is there on the slides of course. Okay, we have kind of done some stuff like this when we did conditional probabilities in the last chapter. So, I will just skip it and move on. Okay. So, we have defined joint CDFs and joint PMFs. Now, we will talk about joint, uh, joint PDFs. So, for two jointly continuous random variables x and y, the joint PDF is a non-negative function f x y x y such that for any set C in the two dimensional plane, we have probability that x y belongs to C is integral over the region C f x y x y dx dy. Okay. So, the joint CDF can be obtained from the joint PDF as follows. So, joint CDF of x y at values a comma b is integral minus infinity to a and integral minus infinity to b of this uh, joint PDF. And likewise, the joint PDF is a, dub, a double derivative of the joint CDF at which values x equal to a and y equal to b. So, PDF being derivative of CDF we have seen last time. Now, we are going to take derivatives of with respect to multiple different values, okay, because there are many random variables involved in this process, alright. And pictorially, uh, you know, this formula over here can be represented as follows. So, this is our region C. And basically, we are integrating the probability density over this region, all right. And that gives you a probability mass, which uh, which is the uh, probability of this particular event. Okay, so does the probability of this event have to be equal to the area of C? Does it have to be equal to the area of C? Okay, this is a, my checkpoint question to the class. Okay. Does it have to be equal to the area? Of course, equal to the area of C divided by the area of the rectangle. Does it have to be that or can it be something else? Question or comment? I have not said any such thing. Okay, yeah, so if it is a uniform distribution on this area, then it is fine. But it could be any arbitrary distribution. Remember, it could be a bell curve, which I showed you last class. All right. So, if it were a uniform distribution, then what I said was true. In all other cases, it is not true. In all other cases, it is not true. All right. All right. So, one more example of marginalization. The marginal PDF of a random variable can be obtained by integrating the joint PDF with respect to the other random variable or other random variables. If for example, in this case we have got just two and we are integrating out one, but we may want to integrate multiple random variables if they so exist. 
So, here we have got f x x is integral minus infinity to infinity f x y x y dy and f y dy is likewise integration is with respect to x ok. So, in, in fact, starting from this particular formula, uh, I get f x x equal to minus infinity to infinity f x y x y dy. Now, I am going to do one more thing. I am going to take another integral from minus infinity to a f x x dx and what is this guy? This guy is capital f x at a and this is equal to integral minus infinity to a integral minus infinity to infinity f x y x y dy dx and this is f x y a comma infinity right. So, this is also kind of proof of what I showed you for CDFs a few slides ago all right. Yeah, let me go back to this slide, this slide uh, ok. So, the question is does the y less than or equal to infinity have any significance ok. Suppose instead of infinity it was some finite value ok. So, let us say y can take values from minus infinity to infinity and I put in the value 10 over here ok. What is going to happen ok. Let me push this question back to the class. What do you think will happen? You mean uh, so you do not like the less than or equal to infinity or you do not like the less than infinity ok. Can we hear why you do not like the less than infinity? So, basically what I am saying here ok, uh, what I am saying here is I have a joint event where x is less than or equal to little x and y could be anything ok. So, that is what the less than infinity means alright. Uh, does that answer your question? You you do you are looking very skeptical ok. So, basically what I am saying with this notation is that I am placing no restriction on the values of y whatsoever uh, and that is the same thing as doing a marginal pdf. So, when I say I am not placing any restrictions on y it means I am totally ignoring the value of y and that is what I do when I am doing a marginal ok. All right. Now, let us go to a definition of independence ok. As it is I got a lot of questions about what is this independent random variables in the weak law of large numbers. So, we will start answering that question ok. So, two continuous random variables are said to be independent if and only if for all x comma y f x x y is f x x f y y. In other words the joint pdf is equal to the product of the marginal pdfs ok. So, this is the definition of independence of a pair of random variables. Starting from this definition, I can prove that the joint CDF will also factor out into the product of the individual CDFs. So, f x y x comma y is f x x f y y ok. Can you prove this right? Maybe we should prove this. So, we have got this to begin with and what do I have to prove? So, what am I going to do? What will I do? I will integrate both the sides of this equation. Uh, so, I am going to do minus infinity to x minus infinity to y f x y x comma y dx dy equal to minus integral same limits ok. So, what is this thing here the left hand side? it is the definition of capital F x y x y ok. And on the right hand side you have an integral with respect to x y and both the uh, uh, x and y can separate out. 
So, you have minus infinity to x f x x d x and likewise for y. So, you have f x x and f y y right. So, these are definitions of the marginal c d f s and this is the definition of the joint c d f that is why. Okay, so when you got independent random variables, the PDFs factor out. It is called the joint PDF factors out into the product of the marginals, and so does the joint CDF. Okay. Okay. Now we were talking about the independence of two random variables. Now we will extend this definition to n random variables. Okay. So we have some n continuous random variables. Uh, x1, x2, xn, okay, n of them, and we say they are mutually independent if and only if for any finite subset of k random variables xi1, xi2, xik. So, what is this i1, i2, ik? They are indices taking values from 1 to n. So, basically, I am taking any k of these n random variables. So, I have these k random variables and I have a finite sequence of k numbers little x1, little x2, little xk and then I am going to construct events xi1 less than or equal to x1, xi2 less than or equal to x2, xik less than or equal to xk. Okay? So, I will say that these random variables are independent if and only if all these events are mutually independent. Which events am I talking about? The event that each of these random chosen random variables takes on some arbitrarily chosen value. Okay? So, regardless of what values I pick, I want these events to be all mutually independent. If, I, if that happens, then I say that these random variables are also mutually independent. Okay? Now, as a consequence, okay, so if these events are independent, as a consequence of that, I will get the following. Okay. So, this is an n way joint PDF. Okay. n way joint PDF. This is going to factor out into the product of the marginal PDFs. Okay. And this condition is stronger than pairwise independence. I will show an example. Okay. So, uh, if I have n independent, uh, if I have n random variables, and on one hand, I claim that all n of them are independent, mutually independent. That's one statement. And the other statement is that given any pair, okay, that those those are uh, independent. Okay, so this n way independence is a stronger notion. Okay. So pairwise independence means that all pairs are independent of each other. Okay. So, mutual independence between n random variables implies that they are pairwise independent. Okay? Mutual independence implies pairwise independence, but not vice versa. Okay? So, we will consider a, a simple example. Okay? So, consider a sample space 1, 2, 3, 4, where each singleton element is equally likely to be chosen. So, there are 4 values, each of them is probable. Uh, each one of them can take uh, can be chosen with a probability one fourth. Now we are going to construct sets like this: A is one two, B is one three, C is one four. Okay. Now see what happens here. Okay. P A is equal to P B equal to P C is half, but P A B C is uh, one fourth, right? Because P A B C is what? It's the intersection of A B C. Okay, and then that's going to give you uh, a value of one, uh, right? Just one, the set containing only one, and the probability of that is one fourth, which is clearly unequal to PA, PB, PC. Okay, so ABC are not mutually independent events, but they are pairwise independent. Okay, they are pairwise independent. How? PAB is what? What is the intersection of P? Uh, of a and b it is 1 which is probability of which is one fourth. 
P A is half, P B is half, so that is satisfied. And this is also equal to P A P B. And you can verify this for A C and B C. Okay. So here we had a case where you know pairwise these events are independent, but they are not mutually independent. Okay. So when I say some things are mutually independent, that is a stronger statement. Okay. And when we were talking about the weak law of large numbers, when I said independent random variables, I meant that they were mutually independent, all of them were independent. Now let us move on to few more concepts, okay, about relationships between different random variables. So the covariance of two random variables x and y, we are going to define this quantity, alright. It is the expectation of x minus mu x times y minus mu y, that is the expectation. This is called the covariance, alright. So, uh, we have seen a quantity like this in class earlier, okay, the correlation coefficient, except that it was there was a denominator term which is not 1, okay. But here we are looking at the covariance, okay. And we are going to look at the covariance in terms of the expected value of x and y in this derivation. So, we have got expectation of x minus mu x, y minus mu y and I am going to open out the brackets and I will, I get expectation of x y minus mu x y minus mu y x plus mu x mu y, right. And using the linearity of the expectation operator. I can write this as expectation of x y minus expectation of mu x y, okay, minus expectation of mu y x plus expectation of mu x mu y, alright. So let us look at the first term. So this is E of x y. What about the second term? Okay, I have E of mu x y. Mu x is a constant. Okay, let me repeat this. Mu x is a constant. Why is it a constant? Because it is a property of a random variable. In this case, it is the expected value of the random variable x. So, the x is a random variable, but mu x is not a random variable. It is a constant. Okay. So, it just comes out of the expectation operator and this is E of y which is mu y basically. All right. So, likewise this is mu y mu x and this is again mu x mu y, okay. So, what happens is the one of these two terms cancels out with the last term and then I am left with E x y minus mu x mu y, which is basically a E x y minus instead of mu x I write E x and instead of mu y I write E y, okay. So, the Covariance of x comma y can also be expressed as e x y minus e x e y. This form turns out to be very useful when you actually solve problems. Okay, you will see that in the next chapter when we will deal with families of random variables and we will derive these values for different kinds of random variables. Okay. So, these are two alternate expressions for the covariance of two random variables, alright. So, this covariance has some properties, okay. Covariance x comma y is equal to covariance y comma x, right. Is this true, right? It, it should be obvious, right, because it just follows from the commutativity of multiplication. I mean, I can just change the order in which I am multiplying, nothing really changes. So, that is clear. Then covariance of x comma x, this is what? This is the variance of x, is the variance of x, okay. The covariance of a x comma y, alright, is a times covariance of x y. How would you prove this? What would change? So, in this slide, you would put a here, okay and which means you would put a outside this bracket here and you can take it out of the expectation and then everything else follows, okay. simple, right. And then obviously what is the relationship between this and the correlation coefficient, okay. 
the relation is that r x y which is the correlation coefficient between two random variables is covariance of x y divided by under root variance x times variance y all right i suppose this is clear since all of you know the definition of r x y this should be clear but if it is not let me know i can show it to you okay all right now covariance of x plus z comma y okay that's the next property we're going to look at so this is equal to i am claiming it's covariance x y plus covariance z y all right so what is this this is like a linearity of covariance all right so how we do we prove this covariance of x plus z comma y is e x plus z uh, times y minus e x plus z e y how can i write this step because we proved it here okay so that step comes from this slide this part all right carrying further like this now i will open out the bracket so I, this one becomes x y plus z y this becomes e x e y and then you have e z e y all right and ultimately uh, you get e x y plus e z y minus e x e y minus e z e y so what is this first two terms imply this is covariance of x comma y and the last two terms is the covariance of z comma y okay so we proved it this is the sum of just two random variables here okay now we can extend this to have multiple uh, summation of multiple random variables so i have covariance between y and summation over i xi and i have covariance between summation over i xi and summation over j y j all right and these formulae hold i am not going to prove those in class okay you should try proving it yourself the proof is in principle similar to what this is there is no major difference all right now to answer uh, to answer his question okay so he was asking me uh, why is it that i said that the variance of the summation of random variables is equal to the summation of individual variances okay in other words let's move to the document reader so his question was why could i claim okay all right so this claim is true only when all xis are independent random variables so it's true if all xis are independent rvs means random variables okay it is not true otherwise and i'm going to explain the reason on this slide so variance of summation over i xi is nothing but the covariance of this summation with itself we showed that just a while ago okay so then using this property i would apply this property over here and i get summation over ij covariance xi xj all right right what am i doing I, this is a property of sums of uh, covariance of sums of random variables which is the sums of the ori original individual covariances right so i'm plugging this formula down here and then i get summation over i covariance xi xi okay so these are cases where i and j are identical and then i have a summation where i and j are not identical so i have covariance of xi comma xj all right so what is covariance of xi comma xi that's just the variance itself okay and this other guy is covariance of xi comma xj okay 
uh, it turns out okay that for independent random variables this summation is zero and not just that individual covariances are zero and because of that the summation of the variance is is equal to the variance of the sum of the random variables all right so that is the answer except that you have got to prove this what happens the covariance of independent random variables right so if random variables are independent their covariance is going to be zero okay i think i have a proof of this on the next slide here it's here it is okay so covariance x y is zero if random variables are independent okay in other words what's going to happen is e of x y is equal to e x times e y okay we are going to prove this and we are going to prove this for discrete random variables but a very similar proof exists for the continuous case which you are encouraged to try out all right so e x y is what it is summation over i summation over j x i y x i y j probability of p x equal to x i y equal to y j okay does everybody understand this step which i'm tick marking here do you understand this step why did i write this right it is nothing but the definition of uh, an expected uh, the expectation of a random variable okay anybody who doesn't follow this step please ask all right so then uh the random variables were independent so the joint pmf is going to factor out into the product of the marginals all right so uh i have the product of the marginals and now i can collect all the terms in the summation which depend only on i or which involve only i and the terms which involve only j and therefore i have the luxury of splitting the summation into product of two summations so what is this first thing here it is summation over i xi p x equal to xi and this is the expected value of x likewise this is the expected value of y so we prove that e x y equal to e x e y when the random variables are independent in other words the covariance is zero and hence the correlation coefficient is also zero okay so does this completely answer your question yeah. all right yeah any questions or comments about this okay so there is another way of doing the same proof similar steps okay i i'll just leave it for you to to study okay and i'm going to leave uh, another small optional piece of homework okay i am not going to give out the answer immediately but maybe next class given random variables x and y covariance x comma y equal to 0 does not necessarily imply that x and y are independent all right so you are going to prove this statement by giving an example all right so independent implies that the covariance is 0 but just because the covariance is zero it does not mean that the random variables are independent okay in fact the mean the covariance and the variance together do not give you full information about the random variable at all they are just some properties okay but they are not a complete picture of the random variable what is a complete picture of the random variable it is actually either its pmf if it's continuous it's the pdf or equivalently it is the cdf but not just the mean variance covariance okay so you have to do this uh, you have to think of an example of this kind and then uh, i will tell you some in the class next class okay so let me repeat independent implies covariance is zero In fact, very vari uh, random variables whose covariance is zero are called as uncorrelated random variables. Okay, 
So, independent implies uncorrelated, but uncorrelated need not imply independent. Okay. So, now there is another concept that is uh, that we need to define. Okay. And that is the concept of the conditional PDF, CDF, PMF. So, we have done marginals. Okay. We have done marginal PDF, CDF, PMF. We have also, also done joint. And now we have to do conditional. Okay. So, if you have random variables x and y with the joint PDF fxy x comma y, the conditional PDF of x given y equal to y is defined as follows. Okay. It is fx given y x given y, and this is equal to fxy x comma y divided by fyy. All right. This is called as the conditional PDF. Okay, and this is the derivative of the conditional CDF with respect to x. It's a partial derivative. All right. So now we're going to try to understand this particular quantity. Okay. So the conditional CDF is given as follows. Okay, it's the limit when delta tends to zero of a particular probability. Which probability am I talking about? P of x less than or equal to x given y lying between y to y plus delta. Okay, this is integral minus infinity to x f x y z given y dz. So, I am uh, this z is a placeholder for x and this is basically equal to integral minus infinity to x f x y z comma y divided by f y y dz. So, I am just substituting this in here. Okay. We will continue with conditional PDFs uh, and CDFs in the next class.